So I'm going to ask Akhtar Badshah to come up and do this introduction. Uh, as you heard, Akhtar was instrumental in helping start Global Washington when he was head of Microsoft Philanthropies. And he's now a professor at UW because he has a little bit more time on his hands, and he gets to be my board chair as well at Global Washington. So Akhtar. So before I uh, introduce our speaker, I just want to take a moment to, first of all, I mean, I'm standing up here and looking at this room. There is no place. It is just amazing to see in 10 years where we have come and the connections that we made. So Bill and Paula, thank you so much for what you have started. This is just absolutely amazing. I also once again want to recognize some of the giants in this room who have fundamentally shifted the way in which we think about impacting society. Roy and the work that he has done with Landessa has been a fundamental change maker for all of us, for those of us that are actually looking at human rights and land rights. So Roy just your work has been just absolutely terrific. <laughs> Bill Newcomb is clearly with his World Justice Project has been driving change for what people don't know, that the only reason, how many of you in this room get funding from Microsoft as an organization? Right. <laughs> but the only reason you get any funding is because of Bill Newcomb. When Bill Gates was asked to give, it was Bill Newcomb who actually made it happen. So Bill, we are so thankful that you are actually instrumental in creating Microsoft philanthropy. So thank you very much. And Jennifer Porter you know, shifted this whole thinking about how corporations and governments can work together in bringing about change. And that has led to some amazing collaborations around the world. So Jennifer, thank you very much for the work that you have done. I also want to just recognize the team for the work that they have done in pulling this together. Two events, Women of the World this morning, and immediately followed that by this amazing conference. So Kristen, Andy, Susan, Pratima, and Donnie, please wave, stand up, let us celebrate them. There comes a time in all of our lives to make a decision. And that decision at times can have a transformational experience and a transformational impact. A young man had the fortune, the good fortune, of being employed at Microsoft. And after spending a little bit of time there, he could have continued to be there. He could have gone on to start another company, could have created a fortune, yet decided to go back to Ghana from where he had come from. And looked at how he and what had made him successful. And he decided that that's what he was going to do for his fellow countrymen, for the young people in Ghana, so that they could effectively serve 
in the country, in the continent, and on a world stage. That led to the creation of Asaishi University. I had the good fortune of meeting Patrick in 2000. And at that time, he was just starting this idea. And many of my friends at Microsoft said, you've got to find a way to work with Patrick. What he's doing is going to be transformational. I went and visited Asaishi University in 2003. At that time, it was in a small little building in Accra. And I saw the students, and I saw the energy, and I saw the power of how education in your own country can shift the trajectory of lives. Patrick has taken that and built an institution that serves the continent. It is becoming a role model for global institutions. It is changing the way in which we look at leadership, technology, and learning. And what Patrick has done has transformed lives of people. You heard this morning from our speaker how her life is one of the first students to go to Asaishi University. I am just so thrilled and fortunate to know Patrick and what he has done. And I tell you that there are many people in Seattle who are extremely proud of what they have been able to provide in support of the work that Patrick has done. So please join me in welcoming our global Washington hero, Patrick Awa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this honor, um, for the recognition of the work that we're doing at Ashesi, and for the honor of the award. So I wanted to start by just telling a little bit about how I got to be doing what I'm doing. You know, I came to the United States for college, and my first job out of college was Microsoft. And the company was about 3,000 people, I know because my employee number was 3,000 and something. <laughs> um, and within a few years of working at Microsoft, I noticed something that was startling. The company's annual revenues had grown larger than Ghana's GDP. And it, it, was, it was just such, it was such, a, such an interesting thing to see. Um, you know, a few thousand people putting out an economic output greater than my home country. And so, of course, I determined I'm staying here. <laughs> <laughs> this is where to be. Well, my first child was born, my son, Nanaya, was born. And suddenly, Africa mattered a lot more. Suddenly, I was thinking about what the state of Africa means for his generation, for future generations. And it seemed to me that the story of Africa needed to change. And that the people like me who had had incredible opportunities ought to be part of the solution. I should also add that Nanaya was born shortly after the crisis in Rwanda. And one of the vice presidents at Microsoft, Mike Murray, started this grassroots fundraising to assist in Rwanda. And it made a real impression on me, this guy who 
had probably never even been to Africa, um, just engaged and got, got us all, all engaged. And I got, I got engaged. I made my biggest uh, gifts up until that point for that project. And so there's also, frankly, a bit of guilt involved um, in my decision eventually to leave the company. But it was not, it was not an easy decision. It was frightening. <laughs> I wasn't sure what to do. I thought I would start a software company. And then I ultimately decided to start a university instead. Because as I looked at different problems in Ghana with friends and family in Ghana, we decided that leadership was a fundamental issue. If you took any problem and asked why it wasn't being solved, and you ask why enough times, you settled on leadership and decision making at the leadership level. It was also the case that only 5% of college age individuals went to college in Ghana at the time. And so it seemed to me that by definition, the people in college were going to be running the country 20, 30 years forward. And if we could influence how that future generation is educated, then we would change the continent. So this was the bet. Switch from being an engineer to being an educator, something I didn't really know very much about other than being a customer of an educational institution. Um, so I, but I decided to do it. I want to tell you the story about Petemeni Siakor. He's a young man from Liberia. And he came to live in Ghana uh, during the time of the Civil War in Liberia. He went through high school in Ghana, returned home, and he got involved with a technology company from Kenya called um, Yushahidi. And Yushahidi had this platform to help track conflicts, um, you know, first starting in Kenya but moving to other countries. And Petameni got involved with Yushahidi tracking potential hotspots during the, the 2007 elections in Liberia. He also helped co-found the iLab in Monrovia to be an institution that would carry forward the work of Yushahidi when funding for Yushahidi uh, stopped. And so he set up the iLab, and partly because of that work, um, he came to our attention. And in August 2011, he was admitted to a chassis to study computer science. Um, on a full scholarship from the MasterCard Foundation. In his third year, Ebola struck Liberia and two other West African countries. It was a frightening crisis um, in West Africa. Now, Peter Meni said, said to us, you know, usually when there's a crisis, the NGOs come in. In this case, the NGOs are leaving. It was, it was a crisis that was beyond anything we had seen. Now, international medical assistance started to flow in um, with logistics set up in Ghana, and Petemeni felt restless. So he would call his friends in iLab and ask, what's happening? What's really going on on the ground? How can I help? And he discovered that the way the crisis was being tracked was very manual, manually done, so that if, if a case popped up, it took um, at least five days before it came to the attention of the authorities. So the world was tracking cases that had happened five days, sometimes as much as two weeks in the past. And so he worked with his iLab colleagues to develop a software tool that allowed volunteers to digitize reports. And health workers found out across the country, um, keying in this information, and suddenly, we had real-time data um, and real-time re response to the Ebola crisis. And the work that this young man did, uh, it was quiet, um, but it, it made a real impact on a global crisis, in, in, in the case of a global crisis, that frankly had all of us frightened. And when I think back to um, Petemeni's story, he's back now in Liberia 
still running the iLab. Um, you know, what I see is innovation, I see courage, I see concern, but mostly I see the moral imperative to act. And this is, this is precisely the kind of thing that we wanted to foster with, with the chassis. Um, so how, how do we do it? And Petamenes is one of many stories. Um, now, we've done it, just a few simple things, really. One is modeling behavior. So my team and I model the kind of leadership that we would like our students to have. Uh, we've done it through curriculum and pedagogy. We have an emphasis on multidisciplinary learning and critical thinking. And yes, students study um, and learn how to think quantitatively. They learn science and engineering. They learn philosophy. But they also learn ethics, and teamwork, tolerance, respect for others, a spirit of service. Um, and finally, we also enforce a code of conduct. So we've sort of put it so front and center. Our mission statement is to educate ethical entrepreneurial leaders in Africa. And we've put ethics front and center at a time when many people told us that it ought not to be the business of a university and it could not be the business of a university to, to teach ethics, that this belonged in the church or in the home and so on. But we've put it front and center, it's, it's baked into the curriculum, not through a course titled ethics, but through all our courses really emphasizing it and a leadership seminar um, that I will describe in a little bit. So the thing that we've done differently from my experience at Swarthmore College is that in our first year, we recognized that we needed to be even more intentional around this idea of leadership. And it happened a little bit by accident. Long story short, a bright, visionary, very smart young woman uh, asked to start student government. We told her to start a club instead and she decided to have it, the leadership be selected by a vote anyway. Um, and then she lost the election. And by the way, I had bet with my team that she was gonna lose, uh, that this Mr. Popular guy was gonna win, and he did. But I also bet with my team that the students knew who was the better leader. And so we did an experiment, we did a survey we asked them to rate these two candidates on things like ethics, who they would trust with their money, vision, teamwork, grit, um, speaking skills, and so on. And we also asked them, who would you ask to represent you if Bill Gates were to come speak on our campus? And she blew him away in everything except two questions. The Bill Gates question, so they really did mean to choose him as a president, and charisma. And we had what I would call our first leadership seminar, where we got the students together and we showed them the data. And we started to have the first, question, the first conversation about what constitutes a good leader. Now, after that, we decided to institute a leader, add a leadership seminar series into our curriculum, one on what constitutes a good leader. There was one on what constitutes the governance of a good society. There was one on what constitutes the economic system of a good society, and there was one on servant leadership. And about three years after we started that leadership seminar, Yawa ran for president, and she won with 75% of the vote. And it was the first time in Ghana's history that a woman had been elected head of student government. And actually, I should say, even before there was Ghana, when there was a Gold Coast, so even before Ghana. Um, well, three years later, five institutions had women heading student government. And so 
what we had done with that leadership seminar series and the courage that Yawa exhibited in running for that election and winning it made, made a difference in our country um, and, and a good difference. So which brings me to something that's really important. I mean, the work that we do can't be just about a chassis. I mean, it's best measured by what we see when other institutions start to follow suit. In 2008, an uh, honor system was uh, enacted by students, and Yawa started that conversation when she was head of student government. Um, and, and I think a year and a, and a half afterwards, so she had graduated by then, we had a student-run honor system, the first in Africa. Now there are a couple of high schools that have student-run honor systems, and there are a couple of universities in Ghana studying our system, planning to implement it. The University of Ghana, the oldest university in Ghana, has recently announced that it's revamping their, they're revamping their first-year curriculum to emphasize critical thinking and broad learning. So what we're doing, hopefully, is going to ripple through other institutions. And this is what must happen. When I think about Ashesi moving forward, I think about Africa in the next generation, 30 years from now. The population of Africa will more than double from 1.2 billion people to 2.5 billion people. Now think about that for a minute. In the United States, the wealthiest country on earth today, if I were to come and announce that the US population is going to grow by a billion people, it would be something of a crisis. It would be something of a coming crisis. Well, Africa does not have the wealth the material wealth of the United States today. And we're going to have another more than a billion people within a generation. This is the big problem, um, especially with climate change. This is going to stress everything. It's going to stress security. It's going to stress agriculture. It's going to stress public health, education, uh, availability of jobs. It is a big thing. And something this big requires the actions of an entire society led by really strong leaders. Something this big is going to require good action by governments. Um, and, and yet, this population growth also holds promise. We've seen it before in Asia. Um, if we have a productive workforce and good leadership, this actually represents great economic potential for all the work that needs to happen to build infrastructure, to grow more food, um, to provide healthcare services and educational services, manufacturing of goods for this increasing market. There's all potential, but that potential will be realized only if we have a productive workforce and great leadership. And preparing those citizens and leaders, that is the business of education. It's the business of an educational system. So I've been thinking about this quite a bit, and I'll tell you, it feels a little bit like when I was in Redmond, wondering, what do I do next? Do I leave Microsoft and go do something else? Um, I feel it. <laughs> it's the same feeling in my, in my belly. Um, what am I going to do next? Because what we need to do now has to be a systems effort. We need to do something in a more proactive way to really transform education on the continent, to really transform the way leaders are educated, not only at Ashesi University, but everywhere else. Uh, now, there are a number of things that we can do to, to uh, one thing that I've, is, I was just told yesterday 
by a mentor was, you know, Patrick, you have, um, you've gone through an experience that is rare. You've learned how to build an institution, an educational institution that is excellent in a difficult environment. And that is something that you should share with others. And that is something that you should think about how you deploy to grow what you're doing. So I think we need three things. One is we need a network of exemplars um, in West, Central, East, Southern Africa. Um, we need collaboration between educational institutions. And we need to motivate the vice chancellors and presidents and faculty to really shift how we operate. And I think a great way to, mo to change their motivation is to have a new ranking system that is based on outcomes and impact. And so we're going to try and tackle all of this. We're going to try and figure out and push an agenda to change how we rank universities in Africa. Two years ago, we started a collaborative effort where we invited universities from across the continent. We have reached um, over 200 faculty members already with this effort. Um, and we follow up with them to see how they're changing the curriculum and how it's affecting the lives of students. Um, and of course, we have to continue to make sure that Ashesi remains an exemplar and that through these efforts that we build a network. So that's where we are. Um, there's a lot of work to be done yet. It sometimes seems daunting. But one thing that I know, that that work is necessary. Simply because the specter 30 years from now of another billion people poorly educated, unemployed or underemployed would raise an unacceptable, it will raise unacceptable consequences for Africa and for the world. And so we must act. And just like Petemeni, we do have that moral imperative to do something rather than nothing. Um, and so I really want to end by, again, thanking you so much for recognizing the work that my team and I and the board are working so hard at at Ashesi uh, University. And thank you for the honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we still have time for Q&A? OK. OK, so um, I was asked to leave some time for Q&A so that I'm available to answer questions. But you're also free to just share your own ideas as well. And there are microphones going around the room. So if you raise your hand, a mic will be brought to you. So there's a hand up here that I see. Hi, I'm Cliff from Amplio. And uh, Patrick, I, I was just wondering if uh, you could share with all of us um, how it went when you started implementing the honor code. Because you and I spoke in 2008 or 9, I think. Right. And I recall um, it didn't go well in the beginning. Uh, there were challenges. Right. And I think um, hearing about those challenges and your persistence through it would be inspiring for everyone. So it's a good question. So really, the honor code came about because um, I think a couple of years before uh, we had the honor code, a visiting lecturer pointed out to me that he had given an assignment and a third of his students had copied each other. And this was a real shock to me. Um, so I, I suggested to the faculty and the staff that we were failing our mission if this was happening. And we decided to engage a student body to take ownership for this. It's something that couldn't be something that Patrick owned. It had to be 
the institution owned it. And so, um, and we're fortunate to have Yawa as student government president, and she started the conversation with the students. Now, when we started, not all students were in favor of this, as you might imagine. Um, so we ended up doing it on a class-by-class -class basis. Each class, you know, the senior class, junior class, sophomore, freshman class, um, were invited to vote. Um, one class wasn't invited. I'm not going to say which one it was. <laughs> Um, because when we had the conversations with them, it was very clear, and we could also see the record of what was happening with cases coming through the Judicial Committee of the university. Um, so when we started, three classes signed on to it, and one class did not. Um, uh, that class had a minority group within it that was very passionate about this, but they just couldn't move the rest of their colleagues with them, and we had a rule that you had to have at least two-thirds of the class in favor of it for your class to be brought onto the honor system. Now, that small minority in that class, we made a, we honored a request uh, from them in their final year. They wanted to take one exam, unproctored, trusted by the faculty. And we did. It was a small group. We put them in an exam room and we let them have an experience that they really desperately wanted to have, but were not able to bring all their peers along. And that's really how the honor system started. Um, but it turns out that because of the history of how it started, it has continued that now every freshman class that joins must vote whether they want to join the system or not. They're not automatically on it, um, on the exam honor system. And so, it, it, and that's turned out to be a good thing because every year there's an active conversation involving the freshman class as well as the, you know, the continuing students in whether this class should join the honor system or not and why, why or not they should do so. Hi, Patrick. Um, as a man of color and an immigrant in the U.S., what are the challenges that you've had to overcome to be the leader that you are today? So as an immigrant and a man of color, um, so let me, tell, let me tell you about the immigrant part. So I arrived in the United States at $50. And I'd missed my fl a flight, so I arrived late, and I couldn't get an airport pickup. I had to take a cab. It's the first time I've been in a cab with a meter that ran. And so I could see it running. And um, when I arrived on campus, it was $20 in. Uh, so I, I parted ways with 40% of the money I had, and I had $30. Um, and I went through, of course, I had more than $30 because I had a full scholarship, right? Um, so as an immigrant, you know, when I was graduating my final year, uh, when I got the job offer from Microsoft, I had $200 in my bank account. I didn't have enough money to buy the plane ticket back home. And so they make me this offer, and I say, can I start right away? <laughs> <laughs> and the HR manager, you know, she's like, don't you want to take the summer off or something? I said, no, can I start? OK, how about two weeks? Because I knew that's how far my money would take me. Uh, so when you're an immigrant, there's just this pressure. Um, um, you know, failure is not an option. There's a just, I was very, very focused. Um, as a person of color, I would say that I was very fortunate um, to be in a college where I felt very welcome. Um, I had friends who were from all different uh, races, from different nationalities. I got along with everybody. Um, and I joined a company where I also felt uh, pretty comfortable. Um, so. Uh, you know, that's not to say that I didn't see what was going on uh, around me in America. Um, I was shocked to see that there were homeless people in America. I, the first time someone told me there were homeless people, I, I thought, yeah, well, yeah, okay, so I, I'm from Africa, but I'm not that stupid, right? I, I, I've been watching the movies. <laughs> I've seen American movies. There are no homeless people. Um, but, um, so I was shocked about that kind of thing. Uh, but for me, uh, 
you know, I say that my tribe were geeks, and you know, I, I hung out with engineers, and I was very heads down and got things done. And I nurtured all relationships. I think really all relationships are important. There's a hand up on this side. Thank you so much, Patrick. You are a great inspiration to all of us. My question is, you know, you went from being an engineer to an educator. How did you go about, you know, um, getting all the things you needed, you know, mentorship or the different um, knowledge you needed or when you got to different hurdles, what did you do to go across that hurdle to continue with the vision you have for the university? Right, so I should say that, you know, um, it took me a year and a half after I had the full permission of my wife before I left Microsoft. <laughs> and the reason it took me a year and a half because I was afraid of failure. And the way I managed that, and I was afraid of failure because I didn't know this area. And the way I managed that f fear was to go to business school. So I went to business school to learn about how organizations function. Um, and I determined that, look, I, I will invite people to a board who will advise me on the academic side and the strategic side. Um, and I did that. I hired people who were experts or academics who would complement what I knew. Um, and I also didn't do so well in accounting in business school, so I knew I was going to hire an accountant, <laughs> which I did. Um, so, the, I mean, the, the short answer is I looked for people to complement what I knew. And I was under no, you know, I had no illusions about my ability to manage a faculty or to understand how universities work. I, could, I understood how the business side of things. I had a systems mind from my engineering training. Um, and that was valuable to the organization as well. I had a network in Microsoft that was very valuable from a fundraising perspective. And so I just sort of assembled this team and we did it together. Patrick, in your bio, it says that 90% of your graduates stay on the continent. What's that conversation like when your students come into your office and ask, if they should do what you did and leave and come back, or if they should stay? How do you help them make that decision? Well, there have been very few students who've actually asked me that question. Um, and the, the reason is, you know, when you, edu when you edu educate people in country, they're forming networks there. Um, they're getting a great education. If you prepare them well enough to find a good job in country, then the question does not arise. And so that's been our focus. Uh, you know, so there's all the conversations that we have about Africa and why it needs to change and all the seminars that students go through. Um, and those of you who were here this morning listening to Yawa, you could, you could tell that just Passing through Ashesi, there's been such a strong conversation about the need for this generation to take a stand and to help build a continent for the, for the future happiness of generations to come. That they've sort of, they sort of have that mindset to begin with. Um, and then all that we need to do to close the loop is to make sure that we're preparing them to get a good job as well. And once you do that, the question doesn't arise. Hi. Um, I'm over here. Over here. Okay, all right. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm a dietitian with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And so um, I am curious if your university has a program that trains nutrition professionals. And also, more generally, um, how you decided what academic areas to offer to best serve the needs in Ghana. Okay. 
So uh, we don't do nutrition yet. We will one day. Um, we chose the curriculum, I mean, we designed the curriculum after going to Ghana and doing focus groups with leaders across uh, society. So this business leaders, people from the public sector, from the military, from faith-based organizations, education. And we asked them what gaps needed to be filled and we listened very carefully. Um, and then we also went to high schools and asked the kids, you know, th those were just surveys, those were not focus group surveys about what, they, what careers they wanted to pursue. We did the same with parents of kids in high schools. And then we took all that data and asked the question, which of these can we do given the resources that we have and which are the highest priority ones? And so we start with the highest priority things and where, what was sort of financially and organizationally feasible um, and that was meeting a real need those were the things that we started with. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm over here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kirsten Gagnier, and um, I was raised in Seattle, but first learned about a, a Chessy when I lived across the street from one of your campuses in Labone. Okay. So it's kind of fun to um, come full circle and see all that's happened since then. Um, my question is really around kind of this leadership and ethical vacuum. I just recently returned from a trip to Nigeria where I was talking with colleagues there and their country is going into another election cycle. They were talking about their concern about going into that cycle, given that right now it feels globally that the kind of ethical um, guardrails that were put on countries by the US administrations kind of no longer are currently there. Um, and I'm just wondering to what extent you think that this is an opportunity for some of the um, ethical leadership um, programs that have developed across um, Africa for leaders and countries in Africa to step up and fill some of that ethical leadership vacuum, and also whether there are some of the programs like Adeshesi and you know, Mo Ibrahim's work and other work that can translate to some of our institutions um, to help build back up our ethical leadership capacity in the world. Wow, you have a lot of confidence in what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let me first say that, um, you know, we don't really think a lot about how we might influence American institutions or change America. Um, <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> um, but, but in terms of what's hap what happens on the continent, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. And from our experience at Ashesi, I think that it is incredibly important. You know, I finally, you know, it's funny. It's only after I started Ashesi and started engaging students that I fully understood the power of the Socratic method and of studying philosophy. And as somebody who went to a liberal arts college, okay, um, I had these conversations and debates with my friends when I was in college. But there's something really powerful about getting people together to discuss ideas and to try to answer important questions. What is the kind of society we want? What is a good society? What is beauty? What is desirable? What role are we going to play? Um, what is tyranny? I think just engaging people's minds in a deep way is incredibly, is an incredibly powerful thing to do. Um, you know, in the United States, you know, we increasingly hear um, sort of, uh, it's not disparaging per se, but as I, a little more doubt about the value of the liberal arts and of that kind of broad learning. Um, I think if the US were to move away from that, it would be a mistake. Uh, so the US has already got some things right, just need to not lose it. <laughs> and I know it doesn't feel like, 
like it's on the right trajectory right now for some people. Um, but I have confidence that um, this will endure here. And the task before us is to engage that uh, on our continent. And when I say the Socratic method, it doesn't mean that we're only looking at uh, Western philosophy. We look at African philosophy. Uh, we look at uh, Eastern philosophy. And it's just been really interesting for me to recognize also that somehow Ghana's educational system and a lot of African countries' educational systems lost the local philosophy. And there's a deep sort of philosophical structure there that now you can see in the proverbs, um, in the rural villages that you'll hear some of them, but we're going back to that and having debates and conversations about those. And that's how we do it. Okay, so one last question. I see a hand up here. Yeah, hi. Okay. Um, All right, okay, so you already have the mic. So yes. you, get the last, you get the last question. <laughs> um, I'm Kim, and I am with a Spring Development Initiative. We currently work in Nigeria. Um, I'm speaking after the last um, question because I'm going to be also asking about um, how Ashesi is working um, in the Western African region with other schools in the area. Um, that's one. Two is, you mentioned that you think that um, graduates, of university graduates will make up uh, uh, the leaders of the next uh, decade or so. Do you see that coming true? My experience in Nigeria has been that uh, a lot of our uh, politicians are not um, university graduates, especially away from um, the national uh, federal level. So when you go to the states and the local governments, you have a lot of um, non-graduates. And so I'm wondering whether Ashesi is seeing that in Ghana as well, and whether they're thinking of other ways of engaging um, non-graduates, informal sector, um, transporters, um, other people, co-ops, farmers, the other kinds of people who get into politics and whether they're teaching those ethics and um, philosophy at those levels. Thank you. Okay, all right. So two good questions. Uh, so the first one, uh, simply we've, we've organized uh, a project we call the Education Collaborative. Um, we did it two years ago and we invite universities from across the continent to come to our campus once a year and we do workshops with them around curriculum, pedagogy, university administration, fundraising, uh, and so on. And, and then we follow up. So those that want uh, active engagement with us, we follow up with um, assigning faculty to mentor um, some of their faculty, um, and also working with them as they're designing their curriculum and preparing them also to reach out to their colleagues within their home institutions. So that's, that's what we're doing, and the Education Collaborative is a, we set as a pilot program, and we're gonna steadily grow it, and we're working through how we sort of increase the impact of that, of that project. Um, so the leadership. So first of all, let me say that uh, my definition of leadership is not just the political leaders, it's also all the people who, have, who are in positions of influence. Because anybody that is in a position to organize groups of people to move in a particular direction is a leader. And so when I look at the civil service, I look at businesses, I look at, you know, just throughout our, our society, there are many of those kinds of leaders. Um, so I consider the judges to be leaders. There's no judge who didn't go through a tertiary education. Um, I consider the head of the military or the police force to be a leader. They went through what is sort of the security equivalent of a university. They went through a police academy or a military academy, right? Um, so, so that's what I mean by leaders. And if you look at that definition, then in fact, most of the leaders, maybe not all, but most of the leaders will be people who have had some kind of post-secondary education. Now, so you've touched on something <laughs> that 
is very real. I mean, if you look at the leadership across the continent today, the political leadership I'm talking about now, um, a lot of them are really from my father's generation, maybe a little below my father's generation still. So my generation, we're not in charge in Ghana yet at that level. I mean, there's 70-year-olds running Nigeria, right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with that per se, but it's just that the next generation below them need, need to stand up now, and the generation below us also need to start to, to stand up, and we need to give them the space to do so. So that's a project that's very much in progress. Now, the thing about our parents' generation is that you know, I say that my parents, they were born in the Gold Coast. I was born in Ghana. And that generation, the leaders, the political leaders that emerged out of that were people who really fought against colonialism and got us to independence. But once we had independence, some of them then just became the new colonial masters in a way, or they were just not prepared to really manage the economy a certain way. They were making the wrong economic choices. Um, and so we need to get to that sort of the next level. And that's a transitioning, that's a transition that is going to happen certainly within the next 10 years, right? And, and you will find that when that transition happens, the people who will be running, um, as we've started to see it a bit in Ghana, is there are people who've studied law, they've studied economics, they've studied engineering, you know. Um, those are the people who are gonna be at the political level. The rest of the leadership are also mostly, easily 90% going to be among the 5% back in the day who actually got to do a post-secondary education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, for the, those inspiring words. I think, um, back to Kirsten's comment, I think we, have, we all have a lot to learn from Patrick's work and his demonstration of success in Ghana. I think one of the things we can all do is help tell the stories. Help tell the story of Patrick and Aseshi and all the work that you're doing as an example of how we can transform our world and our society here in the US. So, Thank you again for being here. Thank you again for the conversations. We have the concurrent sessions are next, so we have a short break, and then please find your way to your next session, and then we'll end again where we started this morning. So thank you. <laughs>